why is it that my brother, even though he has diagnosed HD, was taken off his medications when he was recently put into jail? He went 10 days without medication. They were very dismissive when I called to talk to them about his care needs. What do I do if this happens again? That is a terrible situation that should not happen. And I'm sad to say that I've also seen it happen to people um, because the legal system is just not set up to address the needs of people with HD or with mental illness in general. But I'm really sorry that happened because it is a terrible situation. And I don't need to tell any of you, but being taken off your psychiatric medications and possibly your medications to suppress chorea puts you at all kinds of additional risks if you're in a prison population. So if you were on medicine for aggression, you could be more aggressive toward other prisoners or toward the guards. If your movements increase, um, you'll get treated as an outcast by other prisoners, or you might be more vulnerable to attack because they'll see you as having something wrong with you. It's just a terrible situation that I have seen happen. And I've had this experience where I myself have called the prison to try to get someone back on at least some of their medications, and they are incredibly dismissive. They really do not, they are not sympathetic. What I would say is to be as proactive as possible. And certainly uh, to get in contact with your center social worker, if you've, if you've had a relationship with a center or start a relationship now with a center, uh, to really figure out what advocacy venues are there for you um, within the local law enforcement system to figure out, number one, why is your brother getting sent to prison? So is it because he's impulsive? Is it because people mistake him for being intoxicated because his walking is affected? So what is, what's going on at the level of him being arrested and taken to prison? What can be done with local law enforcement? And I know that, that you've developed some great toolkits at Help for HD and that HDSA has materials. And Lisa, you're nodding. You probably have way more resources than I do. But, but I know there are some terrific resources out there about working with local law enforcement because that's probably the first step is understanding why he's going to prison and what can you do to prevent that. And then to work with your social worker to figure out what advocacy channels are available so that if he is incarcerated again, how do you advocate for him to get his medications? If things he's taking are non-formulary, how do you get those medications to go with him? Because it, it should not happen to a vulnerable person. Lisa, you probably have lots of thoughts on this. First of all, it's a rough process. And Dr. Anderson couldn't have said it any better. Um, the first thing you want to do is you want to talk to the chief medical person within the system that that your partner or your relative or your person is incarcerated, whether it's the county jail, the state jail, the sheriff's jail, the prison, and they have a chief medical officer and you want to talk with them early and often. And if they hang up on you, then you put your social worker to work. And actually, Dr. Sung and I and his social worker worked feverishly for months with someone that was incarcerated within his area. And you have to, there are advocates within the state. There are chief medical officers within the hospital system. There are nurses that are in charge of taking care of patients. And they, and those are the people you want to work with. And if you do not get an answer immediately, then you elevate and you elevate quickly because your person, whatever that medication is for, is going to become more afraid, more isolated, and as Dr. Anderson said, extremely agitated. That is not a pleasant place to be, and especially when you have a medical condition. So step one, social worker. Step two, neurologist. Start documenting within the medical records. Start advocating with the medical professional within that institution. And if you don't get something immediately, advocate, advocate, go up the chain to the director of the prison because they have a fiduciary right to care for that person medically and to ensure that person's safety. And it's their job. And sometimes you need to remind them often. If that does not work, you go to your state advocacy associations. You might not know them. We do as social workers reach out to us. Dr. Sung and I have worked with his patients in his world. He has helped me with my patients in mine. 
We, we don't have walls. We will help you. Um, and it's a tough situation. Send you lots of energy and we'll be glad to help you in any way we can. Yeah. And we, most people probably know this at Help for HD. We have a huge law enforcement education program and we have every tool from families talking, medical professionals talking. We have flash drives. We have brochures. We have everything you need. We actually have a full team that will call the jail for you. We have, we have written during court cases. We've actually called where this has happened to a couple families we know. And we, it's some weird thing. You're an advocacy group and you call and we talk to our, the medical, usually the head nurse, but if not, we'll go all the way because you have to remember the top guys, the sheriffs, the police, these are politicians. They are voted in position. They do not want a bad case on their hands. So sometimes we have to go all the way up the line at Help for HD and we do. So please contact us because we had one, he was taken off all his medications. It was in Arizona and we called and talked for an hour and he was on all his medications within a couple hours. He was back on just like that. So don't feel frustrated and that you have to do it yourself because advocacy groups like us, we have set up and when we go in, we're very professional because we have all the tools we need and we know how to talk to them. So let us help you call help for HD, uh, reach out to Vicki Owen, V I C K I at help for HD.org. She runs all of our law enforcement and she will write letters. She will call. She is no joke. <laughs> so get her on your team. And we are we, uh, you'd be surprised we answer emails all night long, typically. So you can call us at any point. Yes. Sorry, shameless plug, but we worked <laughs> really hard on that program. But, and we, know it, <laughs> and it we know it works so well. Yeah. Okay. Next question is for Lisa. My partner is unsafe in the things he loves, like hiking, biking, etc. I must constantly make excuses as to why we aren't participating as much. The truth is, I don't know how to break his heart and tell him that I am scared he will become injured. Do you help with situations like this in your clinic? And is it something I can encourage our team to talk about or to talk to him about? If so, who would be the person to ask to talk to? Really valid, real question. Thank you so much for asking it. Your first point is going to be your social worker in this case. Oftentimes, clinics will do what we call pre-screens. So before you come in for your clinic appointment, we will give you a call and say, how is your loved one doing? Are they having issues holding a coffee cup? Or how are they doing with their activities of daily living? Are they able to exercise? Are they able to do the things that they love? And caretakers, this is your opportunity. If we don't ask, call and talk with us. You can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the social worker prior to that clinic visit and say, my loved one, I'm terrified. He wants to climb to the top of the mountain and I'm not sure he can make it 12 feet off the ground. And what we can do is we can frame that conversation within your clinic visit very organically. So the neuro Dr. Karen or Dr. Victor can say, so are you able to do the things that you like to do? Are you feeling a little worried when you start hiking? Are you feeling a little uncomfortable when you have to really break on that bike? Are you able to change gears? And it's a very safe conversation to where we can understand where those challenges might be. And then what we can do is we can provide resources to help. We can bring in physical therapy or we can bring in occupational therapy to have that person build strength, to build different ways of moving in such a way that you're able to continue to do the things that you want to do. And also too, I think I loved your way you said how do you help our team? And oftentimes too, we will have conversations with friends and family about HD so that you can help friends understand the person might not be able to respond as quickly. There might be some slower processing, but that's okay. This, let that person take the time to gather their thoughts to be able to speak, to be able to communicate. And in that way, 
you're building a support system, you're building a support structure so that you don't have to carry that all on your shoulders alone. And I think that's the most important part is HD is something that's going to in fact impact your way of thinking or your way of moving. But that doesn't mean that we as family and friends and community can't continue to support you. But talk to your social worker. We can, we can be the bad person and kind of start those conversations and have the broader shoulders, allowing you to still care for your loved one and be concerned and get those, converse, those difficult conversations rolling. But again, defer to other people on the panel for their input as well. Doctor, are we ready? Are you, do you guys have anything? Uh, to add? I, the only thing I was going to add is just what Dr. Anderson already said before. Are there parts of those things that you can still do, and maybe doing those things as opposed to doing the whole thing and still providing some enjoyment? I think taking things away completely, we don't want to take that. We want to maintain the quality of life as much as possible. But the, maybe there's still ways to do this, and we're definitely open to talk, talking about all those things in our clinics, so. So Dr. Sung, I am starting the process of being tested. I have an appointment with a genetic counselor. What question should I ask? How should I be prepared? That's a great question. Great question. So a lot of it is knowing what they're going to ask you. That's what you should be prepared for. So what questions you should, I, 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 a lot of things, they'll educate you even if you are not a, educated yourself. So don't feel pressured to know everything about the genetics of HD because that's what the genetic counselor will do is educate you on all those things. Some questions that you might have ready for the genetic counselor would be what steps are involved in the process at that particular site where you're testing. What, besides meeting with the genetic counselor, what other steps are you going to have to be testing? How much does the testing cost with them? Is it the, what are the costs involved? How much does the gene test self itself cost? How long does the test take to come back with the lab that they use? Because they will know the answers to all those things. How flexible will they be in scheduling results disclosure? Like from the time the, res, the test, your test results come back, how long does it take for you to get in to get your test results? And then as far as like, how can you be best prepared? Know that they're going to ask you about things like life insurance, disability insurance, and where you stand on how, what you have on those things. So get your stuff together. Think about those things already ahead of time. Decide who your support person will be. All centers will, are going to require that you have some support person, some primary support person to go through the process with you. So decide who that person will be with you through that process. Be prepared to answer questions about your family history. They're going to ask you specific questions about who in your family had HD, what symptoms they had, and at what ages, what their repeat numbers were, if or if you can have access to them. So prepare that information ahead of time. Be prepared to answer questions on why you want to be tested and why now. And decide if you want to test under a pseudonym. Some centers allow that. Some we do. Decide how you want to pay for the test. Do you want to run it on your insurance or do you want to pay cash? If you want to pay cash, just as a fair warning, none of these testing labs accept literal cash in an envelope. You need to, like, I can't even tell you how many times I've had patients come for testing and they bring an envelope full of cash and we can't do anything with that. Bring a credit card. <laughs> We've had cashier's checks. We also cannot do anything with that. So anyway, but these are these funny, these other little things that you may not think about that I encourage you to think about like logistically and going through the tests. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. For Dr. Anderson, my brother has been in the hospital twice now for suicide attempts. I feel like he isn't getting the proper mental health support and keeps going back to thoughts of ending his life. Are there any services I could be using to stop this continuing cycle? And also I hear that suicidal thoughts seem to go away as the disease progresses. Is this true? 
Yes, I'm very sorry to hear that you're dealing with this. This is one of the hardest things that, that we see families deal with and that we help families through. Uh, and there are some patients that do have repeated attempts like this. Uh, going back to, are you connected to a center? Is it, is it a matter of looking at the environment? So does your brother have, does your brother live alone? Are there support people around? Would your brother do better in a situation where there are, is more activity, where there's more programming? So is it time to think about an assisted living or another more sort of protected environment for your brother? Uh, when they hospitalize your brother, are they really looking at his psychiatric medications and making adjustments or are they going back to the same things? Uh, what can be done to optimize his psychiatric treatment? There may, be, there may be things that could be adjusted that would be really helpful. I'm a big fan of means reduction. So that means if your brother has access to firearms, you have to get those out of the house. If he refuses to give up his firearms, you separate the bullets and the guns or you take the bullets out of the house. Uh, if he has access to a vehicle and shouldn't be driving, you disable the vehicle or you take the keys away. Uh, if there's a family member living with your brother, that person has control over medications and dispenses enough for a day so that an overdose can't happen. So reviewing those kind of safety plans with somebody from your center. Um, again, if you don't have access to a center, please contact one of us because working without walls, we are happy to go through these steps with you and really think about what can we change in your brother's environment. Uh, obviously he's struggling. He's not happy because he's making these attempts. So we want to do everything we can to stop these attempts and also make his life better so that this is not what happens. And in terms of whether suicide changes over the course of HD, so there's been some excellent work by Jane Paulson that shows that there are suicide attempts, there's sort of spike in suicide thinking early on when people first develop some possible symptoms. And then there's another spike with loss of independence, which we talked about before. So when, when people are given a diagnosis and we start to tell them things like, you shouldn't be driving, you shouldn't be working, you can't take care of your kids. So there are a couple of spikes of when people have more thinking about suicide, which can lead to more attempts. I have observed that as the disease progresses and there's more apathy, sometimes people will, will just not act on, on their suicidal thinking in the same way. So they may continue to think about suicide or talk about it but they have less motivation and less ability to plan, which can decrease the number of actual attempts. The other really important thing is to know that not just in HD, where if anyone's struggling with suicidal thoughts, it's important to talk with your brother about them and ask about them. It will not make your brother commit suicide if you ask him about suicidal thinking. It's actually been shown to be really helpful to talk about suicide and it decreases someone's chance of acting on it. So really important to, to ask about suicidal thinking and ask frequently and in a really supportive way so your brother understands that it's not a taboo subject, that it's something that he can talk about with you and with other members of the family. And then is there some mechanism to get your brother into counseling? If it's depression that's driving the suicidal thinking and attempts, it, would he be able to get the free counseling through HDSA? Is there a local counselor who could work with him? If it's more impulsivity, so some people with HD don't necessarily have depression. They're not sad, they're not tearful or remorseful, but they have a lot of impulsivity. So if they think about ending their lives, they may act on it very quickly. So is there something that could be done? Again, the means reduction is a big one for me. So taking away means um, of, of being able to harm yourself or slowing someone down. So literally just this week in clinic, I had a conversation with someone who lives on the 11th floor and looks at his patio and thinks about jumping off the patio. So his husband and I had a discussion about, okay, let's move the couch in front of the patio door for now, because just having to move a piece of furniture out of the way slows you down enough that you have to think about what you're planning to do and probably deters you from doing it. There've been a lot of studies in suicide outside of HD, showing that anything you can do to slow down access to something lethal will make someone less likely to do it. Lisa, Terry, Dr. Sun, any other comments on this? Thank you so much. Beautiful um, what Dr. Anderson said. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Terry, 
I am tired, really tired of watching people watch my sister struggle with her speech and her gait in public. I get angry and I know it's a normal, I know it's a normal response, but I need ideas on how to get past wanting to yell at these people. I shouldn't be laughing you guys. I told you because I don't want to reinforce that angry behavior for sure, but I understand why you feel that way. I totally understand why you feel that way. And good on you for bringing the issue to talk about. I think what occurred to me in this, and I, I know other people on the panel jumped into with this particular question is uh, we focus so much on what's changing with the person who has Huntington's and we focus less on what's happening with the care partners who are witness, who are witness to these changes because you are experiencing loss too. You're experiencing the loss of your partner who you're experiencing the roles that, that, this, that, that person provided for you. You may be in a position to be now providing medical care, which you may or may not have known was in your future. So I think it's really the one thing that you have control over you, you don't have control over other people. And trust me, I totally empathize and with your frustration with that, and it's unconscionable. It's absolutely unconscionable that some people are just rude. And so I would, I would do a couple of things. One is if you feel like controlling anger is hard for you, then you know, it might be that you could reach out uh, to another, like a trusted confidant, potentially a counselor, potentially a medical personnel, and how to manage that anger when it crops up for you. Because if any of us were in that position, and if you can control your anger, that's one thing, but you think that you're getting sick and tired of it. So one of the things that you do have control over is, are there things I can do to mitigate how angry I get? And I would encourage you to think about those things. And Dr. Anderson may have some specific recommendations for how to do that. Some people advertise. There have been uh, different families who've created shirts or pens. I have Huntington's disease. And some people, I think, some people like that strategy and it's helpful for them to put it out there in the beginning. And other people don't like to advertise. And I'm not really sure which side of the fence you sit on, but if you're one of those people who are okay with trying to preempt that kind of response, you, know, you could uh, get those neat t-shirts that say things like I have Huntington's disease or it's a neurologic behavior, or you can take the opportunity when people make a comment or to educate them. But if you're angry, that's probably not the, well, that's, that may be a hardship, right? You try to take the higher road all the time and make it a teaching moment. But the opportunities that you have to make it a teaching moment are good. It's, I want you also, or I should say, I would recommend also, like I say, with somebody you trust, somebody that you're close to is talk about your grief, right? Your grief that things are changing. Your grief of watching your partner and your grief of what you're losing. And, and then see if you can mitigate an anger response. And think about if you want to strategize with being one of those people who advertise out the gate that I have a neurologic disease. So anybody else want to jump in there? Got some other helpful suggestions? I'm going to say that your response is 100% normal. And I agree with everything that Terry has just said. Another option or resource, um, different centers have caregiver support groups. And I think that's a lovely way to be in a room with like-minded souls where you can feel comfortable in saying what's really on your heart what really hurts for you as a caregiver and learn from others that are in the same shoes that you are in. I have a weekly happy hour and it's 
turned into kind of a caregiver support group and that you can come in and say, you know what, this week has sucked and this is why. And you're in a super safe environment and someone else can chime in and say, can you believe this happened to me? And it's that acknowledgement that you're not alone. Because let's be honest, being a caregiver, your shoulders are huge. And you need just as much support and oftentimes more support at times than the actual patient. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that and then to seek those support groups where that or that trusted person or that confidant to where you can just be yourself and have that moment of release. Also, having some one-on-one -on -one counseling is really beneficial as well sometimes to be able, if you're not so comfortable in a group environment, to be able to share those feelings and those frustrations and come up with some coping mechanisms that really work for you. And just to say, I love what you said about the support groups and another shameless plug. Help for HD does have currently two um, virtual support groups. And we've learned that not only does, of course, we'd all like to sit in the same room and hug and all of that, but sometimes it's not doable in situations when you're a caregiver. And so we've tried to kind of COVID and everything happening. It actually became the perfect opportunity to turn it into something virtual. So if people can't leave the home, then they have the chance to jump on with us. Um, so we have one for caregivers specific. That way caregivers can also connect and relate in all of those things, but they don't have their loved one with them where they can maybe not share all that they're feeling. Um, and then we also have a JHD support group for caregivers of someone with JHD or even just that you have a family member that's experiencing JHD. And to find out more about those links, they're very private so that we can't get people hacking our system or anything like that. But to find more information, you can reach out to Katie, myself, Sharon, London, the four of us can all get you that information and it's our first name. So for example, Katie at healthforhd.org. And that's how you will reach out to any of us to get that information. Yeah. So next up is Dr. Sun. I am confused about the Roche trial. Can you clarify what benefit there really is for this subgroup of patients? When it was mentioned many times that the favor favorable changes seen were not clinically significant, why would they be doing another trial that didn't show clinical significance? Oh, this is a big one to unpack. And I was trying to decide how deep I want to go in this. I think I have to just assume that you some things already about this trial already to explain everything about this trial would take up all of our time. But to summarize quickly in May of last year, the Roche trial, they pulled the plug early when they did an interim data analysis and they found that overall for the all 600 patients in the study, when they analyzed the data, it was looking like that the patients on all their major endpoints, the clinical endpoints, the MRI endpoints, things like that, that patients getting the drug were doing a little bit worse than the patients getting placebo. And they didn't think with a little, the little bit of data outstanding that it would turn itself all the way around. And so they went ahead and pulled the plug. But then the recent announcement in January with the reanalysis or when they did a deeper dive into the data, they found that if you divide into two, so in the low dose population, so they tested placebo versus low dose versus high dose. In the low dose group, when they divided patients by age and by their CAG repeat number, so if you have two things, age and CAG repeat number, you can have high age, high CAG repeat number, you can have high age, low CAG repeat number, you can have Anyway, there's four, if you have two variables and high and low and split in half, then you can basically divide all the patients into four different groups, right? So in the low dose group and in the quartile of the quarter of the patients that had both a low age 
which is age less than 48, and then a low CAG repeat number. It's complicated to, to describe what exactly that is because it's built into another variable. Anyway, but low in the lowest age group and the lowest CAG repeat number and getting the low dose of the drug on all the major endpoints clinically, like the motor function, the cognitive function, the shrinkage of the brain on MRI, things like that. It was showing that maybe in that group, there was a, it was flipped the other way, where actually people getting the drug were a little bit better. What they meant by it's not clinically significant is that it's not statistically significant. Because remember, the original trial was powered for to show that it would work with 600 patients in the whole study. But then when you only have a quarter of those patients, a very small number, even though it looks like it might be improving, you can't say with statistical confidence that's a real signal because it's not enough patients. So that's what they really mean by not significant change. And so, But because the naysayers would say, well, because Roche invested $100 million in this drug, that they're not wanting to let it go. But if you have been involved in the HD community and seen how Roche and Genentech have really supported the HD community overall, I think personally that it's more than just that, that they invested $100 million. They really do ha and have shown it that they care about our community. They care about our patients and families, and they really do want to find something that will help and make a difference. And so what they want to do then is to go back with a low dose and look at a lower age and a lower CAG repeat number, and then redo a whole study with enough patients with a large enough number of patients to see if it really will work or not. And it's hugely expensive for Roche to do this, but I think it shows their commitment to the community. So that's the why. And I don't know, for me, it's, we don't know until we do the work. Maybe, maybe it will work out, maybe it won't, but I, I always have hope. There's, it's not dead yet. So that's my take on the Roche trial and my spin, like my take on what that update means and the why. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Sung. Lisa, the next one's for you. Do you, I can, do you recommend traveling five hours away to a center of excellence? I'm struggling to justify the travel time and having it like, and like likely having to stay overnight. I wonder what it, I wonder that, oh, sorry. It's, I wonder what it's like when I develop more symptoms and I'm unable to drive. That's, and I don't have a care partner currently. Can I receive telemedicine? And they reside in Texas. Awesome question. Um, it is our goal in each center to create the best experience for you. And we will work with you to connect you to the closest center, whether it is face-to-face -face or telehealth. I personally support Tennessee and we're a really wide st state. So often many of our patients travel five to six hours to get to us. Each center is gonna have a uniquely different take on this. But first of all, you living in Texas have the incredible opportunity to be part of four different centers or partner sites in Texas. So first, let me give you that information. Dr. Aaron Furstimming is in Houston um, at that center, and their social worker is Madison Kruger. She can be reached at 713-500-7168. And what she can do is talk with you to define and create the visit plan that works for you depending on the stage of HD that you're currently in. Um, if you're just beginning your HD journey, then they potentially or hypothetically might have you come in for your first visit and then have telehealth visits at a time that works for both you and that center. Conversely, if you're not in Houston, there is the Center of Excellence Partner Site at Covenant Medical Group Neurology in Lubbock, Texas, and under the directorship of Katie Henley, and you are able to get care there if that is the closest one for you. Also, too, that clinic coordinator is Nikki, 
Taurus, T-O-R-E-S, and their phone number is 806-725-4115. If you're close to Georgetown, Texas, there is a partner site at Texas Movement Disorder Specialist, and that phone number is 512-693-4041. And that social worker is Latessa Williams, and she can help you support your time frame that works for you. And finally, there's a Center of Excellence Partners site at UT Health San Antonio. And that social worker there is Angela Torres, T-O-R-E-S. And that phone number is 210-450-99. 60. The goal here is to make the plan that works the best for you. Uh, as you develop, I see in your question, you ask, as I develop more symptoms and unable to drive, is telehealth an option? And the answer to that is yes. Um, also too, many of our centers become incredibly creative and have you participate in research if you are able to, and oftentimes that provides the ability for reimbursement for mileage. Um, and then on top of it all, I think the best part of being in an HD clinic is that it's truly interdisciplinary. So that when you do come in to see us, either it be face-to-face -face or via telehealth, you will oftentimes be able to see a neurologist, physical therapy, speech therapy, and social work all within that one appointment time. And many of us will work to ensure that you have your research on that same day so that we try to minimize those trips to be the most value added when you are there. Thank you for the question. It's a great one. I think the thing that I would add to that is, <clears throat> I'm sure Lisa, your patients and Dr. Anderson, your patients as well would say that it is worth the five or six hour drive to go to see a center of excellence when they provide so many other things. I think, is it worth fi driving five to six hours just to see me? Probably not. But to see my whole team when you come to a big HD clinic, I think most of our patients would say that it's worth it. But the distance is an issue and there are ways to mitigate that with like a lot of my patients that come long distances. So I've got about 300 HD patients in my clinic and 90% of my clinic lives more than an hour and a half away. I've got a lot of patients driving from different states that are five and six hours away. But what we do for those patients is let's just see you once a year in the big clinic, but then we'll do telemedicine mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff and get you care in between or something like that. And then as Lisa spelled out so beautifully, she looked everything up for you. I'm from Texas originally. You know, everybody knows how, if you're in Texas, you know how big it is. On I-10 from El Paso to the east end of Texas is further than El Paso to LA on I-10. So that just shows you the width of Texas is so big. But with those four centers of excellence, unless you live in El Paso or Harlingen, way down in South Texas or Dallas, Lubbock, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston covers a huge swath of Texas. So Dr. Firstiming and her partner sites have now most of Texas covered. Even, I'm just doing the math, El Paso is tough because it's way out by itself, but, and there, but there's really nothing between El Paso and San Antonio. And, uh, but, and then Dallas, Dallas to Lubbock's about four or five hours. Dallas to Austin's about three hours. Dallas to Houston's about five hours. So that can be a little bit uh, trickier. We are working actively on trying to get a center of excellence in Dallas. We need one badly, but that's tricky. And then South Texas. But anyway, the, a lot of the state is covered and we are trying desperately, all of us, to get the whole country covered. And even if we don't have a center of excellence near to you, because this whole concept of centers without walls, there, there are ways to get you help and connected to a center. But yeah, I would argue that it's worth it. Obviously, we're biased because we work in these big centers. So, Thank you. For Dr. Anderson, can you please clarify why people in prodromal stage of HD can't participate in clinical trials, not enroll the others? 
So we get this question a lot. So clinical trials, meaning there's some kind of an intervention, um, usually a medication of some kind, like a drug. I think some of it has to do with the way that our rating instruments are developed. So if you look at all of the measures that we use in clinical trials, they were really developed originally in the clinic to rate change in people who have active HD symptoms and have a diagnosis of HD, which has always been based on having movement symptoms. So having chorea, dystonia, balance problems. So I think this is a part of it that, that the measurements that we have that are really well validated that the FDA accepts and that we're all comfortable with uh, were developed for people with symptoms. I think part of it is caution that as we saw with the Roche study, some of these treatments can have a lot of side effects. Some of them may actually cause harm and you know, it's a matter of risk. So it's one thing to ask somebody who has active disease, who has symptoms of HD to accept risk. It's another thing to ask someone who has absolutely no symptoms, but has the gene expansion and knows at some point they're going to, ex they're going to have HD to accept the risk of being in a clinical trial. That said, I've had this conversation with many people who are at risk, but not symptomatic who say, you know, I would do anything to not get HD. I would be in any study. I would accept any risk. And there is a lot of movement now in redefining how we how we categorize people with HD for research, not for clinical care, but for research, so that some of the memory changes and other subtle changes that we see early on can count more toward being in a research study early on. Because there is recognition that for some of these treatments, not all of them, but some of them, it may be better to study them in earlier groups of patients. So we really do need a way to include people in studies who don't have a diagnosis of HD based on movement symptoms. So there, there is some movement in that direction. I think, unfortunately, drug development can be a little slow and it can be very frustrating because we all want things to be available for people who don't have symptoms yet. And I think the other part of this is for clinical care, we don't, so we want to be really clear that if we are redefining when someone is diagnosed for research, we don't want to rush people into an HD diagnosis for clinical care if they're not ready. So if you don't want to be in research and you don't want to be diagnosed with HD, that's a separate question versus you want to be in research and you want to be thought of as having some early symptoms of HD to be in a study. But there are studies that are pushing earlier and earlier in the condition to where people can be included. So I know it's slow and I know it's really hard to tell people to be patient. Um, because everyone has been patient for so long, uh, but, but the studies are moving in that direction. I don't know, Dr. Sung or anyone else have anything to add to that? I think the thing that I would add is that your question specifically is being worded, why can't prodromal patients participate in clinical trials? And if you mean why can't they participate now, the simple answer is because none of the current clinical trials that are open to patients have in there what we call inclusion exclusion criteria they they don't allow for patients with prodromal hd to be in them you have to have manifest hd to be in them um, but then the why for that is what dr anderson was addressing why would and none of us as the investigators have control over that it's the, the drug companies that design these clinical trials they determine who they want what kinds of patients they want in the study and not, and we can't control that. So if it's been set out that way, you can't come to Dr. Anderson and Dr. or me and say, like, can you find a way to squeeze me in? We can't change the criteria that have already been laid out. But as far as why would a drug company design a trial and not and exclude um, prodromal patients, uh, m many of those are the reasons that Dr. Anderson said. But another big reason, if you think about it scientifically, is that in prodromal HD, the disease is progressing the most slowly, right? The further you get on the disease, you guys know this, the faster, the more it accelerates, right? It's picking up steam and how it's progressing. So if they allowed patients in the study that are prodromal or the earliest phase, it's the hardest to study because you're not going to change very much across a year of a clinical trial. And so if you don't change very much or your brain doesn't change very much, then it's hard to show that the drug is making a difference, right? If even without the drug, your disease would not get that much worse in a one-year period, 
then how can you prove that this adding this drug made a big difference if your disease itself is not moving very much in that time period? And so the only way to show a big difference in a prodromal population is to do a very long study. We'd have to do four or five year long studies. And then over a four or five year course, we could show that with the drug, you didn't progress. And without the drug, you did progress. And that's the scientific reason why this is very difficult and costly for a drug company to do that and look at that population that won't, that wouldn't be changing very much um, during that time frame. But stay tuned, it's coming. You Sorry, know. you could look at biomarkers, right? So right. part of what we're working with the FDA right. on, and this is a process because it's the FDA, uh, is to to get them to accept that there could be changes in biomarkers that you could mention you could measure in prodromal patients that would right. make studies not so long. But that would mean accepting that a biomarker like the level of mutant Huntington in the brain or inflammatory markers change but you don't necessarily see a change on one of these clinical rating scales that we're all so comfortable with using in HD studies. That's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, and the FDA is reasonable, like very conservative about that because of all this stuff with, with aducanumab in Alzheimer's disease and all the firestorm that that brought on them. So they're very, they're not trying to move the FDA on that for HD has been slow, but we are working on it. But just stay tuned. Our first clinical trial that is going to allow pre-symptomatic patients in will start later this year. So it's coming. We're, and believe me, as investigators, Dr. Anderson and I, we're all fighting hard for all of our patients to have access to these drugs sooner. Thank you guys so much.